Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So continuing day three um, of the lectures. So um, I saw, I'm just repeating just one slide that I started with the end of yesterday, which was basically talking about balance relations. These are um, differential relations in X and Y, not in T typically, between the fields H, U, and V. We're thinking about either shallow water or Today, we'll also be looking at these vertically averaged or the green Nagby equations, uh, two different representative systems which have three prognostic variables. So a balance relation or is a relation relating three of these, the three primitive, so-called primitive variables in these systems. Um, you need a pair of them to eliminate a pair of time derivatives, and that will then remove your inertia gravity waves. And what you get is critically dependent on what you choose for f and g. There isn't a, a universal description that tells you that there is a, a best f and a best g. People have been seeking that for a long time. Um, and uh, there have been statements, uh, I think Michael McIntyre himself likes to refer to this situation as a fuzzy manifold. There's almost balance, but there's some maybe stochastically or some kind of very small layer around it, um, which you can never get exactly to balance. Um, this has been like a holy grail for many people thinking about the mathematical aspects of balance for a long time, since the 70s, 80s. Um, I think there was a Newton Institute program that I was at in the late 80s, early 90s on balance, in fact, and this was um, a subject that was uh, active at the time. And there were a couple books, which I'd recommend by um, I think it's Ian Rulston from, uh, I think at the time he was in Surrey in the UK, and uh, he wrote a couple of books that basically amalgamated all the different um, lectures that were given at the Newton Institute at the time. But they're great books on the subject of balance. Um, so anyway, um, in general, um, there may be a whole hierarchy of, of balance relations that may be of different orders of accuracy in some sense. Um, normally, you can't well, you can estimate mathematically what the accuracy might be, but you have to actually do the numerics and, and check what you get in practice to see how accurate they are. And that was done originally in this paper back in uh, 2001. But just to, um, again, remind ourselves of the quasistrophic model. The quasistrophic model uses the very simplest balance relations, that is saying the divergence, which is a differential relationship between u and v equals zero and something called uh, proportional to the um, ageostrophic vorticity. If I divide all this by F, then um, this is the ageostrophic vorticity. If you set that to be zero, um, you're in geostrophic balance. And this basically, these two conditions lead to geostrophic balance. Um, and these are the balance relations that underlie the quasistrophic model that I derived in day one. Um, a substantially more accurate model that I'll be discussing or using today is a balance um, obtained instead by requiring the first time derivatives of delta and the first time derivative of gamma to be zero. And if you go through the algebra, and I'm not going to do it here, but they, you get messier equations. The first equation comes from setting the first time derivative of delta equal to zero. It's basically the right-hand side of that equation um, equal to zero. And the right-hand side of the delta equation is all this mess, OK? So if you're actually going to do a numerical model using the variables delta and gamma, and that's a very nice model to use, then uh, the delta equation would have this on its right-hand side. The gamma equation would have this on its right-hand side. All of it can be readily computed. It's not uh, particularly difficult. But it's quite different from the standard primitive variable formulation where you use a, q, and v. You have to do a little more work by using these variables in the sense of um, so-called inversion, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, but using these balance relations um, will find gives a much more accurate balance beyond the QG case. Um, and uh, it's good enough in most cases to um, be able to see um, visually um, gravity waves. And by, um, I mean not just visually, but you can quantify them and see that the, the structures that you find um, from using the balance relations um, are um, gravity waves in the sense that they obey the frequency dispersion relationship that you would expect for gravity waves. Okay, then 
between, besides the two relations that you choose, the F and the G equal to zero, you also have a further condition, which is that the potential vorticity itself is some function of H, U, and V, a differential relationship between H and V. For shallow water, it's this. And so using this relationship between H, U, and V and the other two that you hear, you have here, you have a generalized PV inversion algorithm. So this is the way you get then the balance. But every instant of time, purely from the field Q and these nominated balance conditions, you can get U, V, and H, your primitive variables. Okay, so how am I going to use that here? So for example, if I want to use this diagnostically, then um, I will call the fields obtained by using those relationships um, fields that have a subscript B. So H, V, U, B, V, B will be the fields that are balanced using some relations, typically the, the ones I gave you at the end of the previous slide. So the, I'll be typically using these relations here uh, to define the balance part. So you'll actually have a U, B, V, B, delta B, et cetera, everywhere on this when you find the solution. Then the, the residual, what's left over from the original fields, H, U, and V, um, will be called the imbalance. And H, U, and V will either come from a shallow water simulation using um, that's unbalanced, um, maybe carefully balanced initially, but will become imbalanced in time. Um, and we're looking at the differences, which are generally small. So here's an example of a divergence field in some simulation I found. Here's the balanced part of it, and here's the residual. In this case, the residual is comparable to the balance. It's not a very well-balanced case. This is not typical, but uh, if you don't prepare the initial conditions, you typically find um, that the imbalance can be comparable to the balance. But this is especially true for variables like divergence. If I were to show you the same thing for vorticity here, you'd find the, the imbalance vorticity is much smaller than the balance part. So imbalance, divergence tends to be a more um, imbalanced variable, which is why um, the QG approximation sets this variable exactly equal to zero, at least the leading order in the equations. You can actually deduce what delta is in quasi-stropic theory at the next order in Rossby number, but that's another subject which um, will open up a can of worms. Yes? So in the balanced model, um, if I go back to these equations here, um, so if I went back to the original quadrostrophic balance that is typically used for doing a very first pass, like getting geostrophic wind fields or whatever else, or flow fields on the surface of an ocean, um, you would use maybe these relationships here and they're non-divergent. But you could do better. What I'm saying is that if you're willing to solve these nonlinear equations that are elliptic but nonlinear, you're willing to do the work, you get also a balanced divergence. Yes? There's vorticity, yes. So vorticity. Well, that's right. So the, 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 the vorticity comes in through this, this gamma variable here is hiding. The, the, oh, here's the vorticity there, okay. right? So it's F times, F times zeta. Yes, but it's uh, it's just sort of the part of, that's the linear part of the right. the wave propagation mechanism. But we're trying to limit the, we're trying to eliminate these waves, and so remarkably, using these relations are basically trying to filter out um, these waves. So we're essentially by you know effectively any any pair of time derivatives of any variables that are distinct can be used to eliminate two time derivatives from the dynamics, and that will eliminate gravity waves. But then the question is, well, did I use the right relations? Well, there isn't a right relation. There aren't a set of pair of relations that we know are optimal, okay? And that's a debatable subject. And, it, and it's very much dependent on the flow regime you're in. So if we have small Rossby numbers and fruit numbers, almost everything gives you good results. So even at, you know, if the Rossby number and fruit numbers are small, then even basic QG balance gives you good approximation. But if they're order one or 0.5 or something, this is a much better approximation. Um, but you know, going higher order than this, um, eventually it's a disordered asymptotic series. 
of engine, this is what we showed in this earlier paper referred to here, is that you can't, that the, the asymptotic series you get is disordered eventually. And so there's no point going to, say, setting the second time derivatives to zero and looking for balance when the Rosen numbers are order one. Then you actually get worse results. Okay, so it's, it's complicated. The nice thing about these, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I judge it against the shallow water model, but in, in this sense of, of doing, uh, of, of looking at the balanced or imbalanced part, we're, we're not questioning the shallow water model. We're saying the shallow water model is our, is our truth, okay? And, th and then we're, what? No, no, this is 2D. We're just stay within 2D today. And, but we'll do some 3D in a minute. But uh, for now, in 2D shallow water, if that's our, our base model, our, our truth model, we're saying that, okay, um, we're simply diagnosing the balance, seeing how much of the flow is actually balanced and how much is imbalanced. So the truth measure here, how well we do, is the magnitude of that imbalance. If the magnitude of that imbalance is small, it's smaller than any other measure we can get from other, other balance conditions, then we say we've got the best measure. So that's what leads to optimal PV balance, which I keep referring to, which I'm, I don't want to talk about yet, but optimal PV balance does even better than this. Yes. Yeah, so delta imbalance turns out to be comparable to the balance part. This is a, an example where it doesn't pay um, to, yeah. But there are other results I'll show you in a minute where it does, where the imbalance is actually significantly smaller than the balance part. So it's funny, when we first started writing papers like this and talk about balance divergence, people said, what? You know, divergence is imbalanced. You think that divergence should be an imbalanced field, but in fact, uh, there's a component, a part of it is, is balanced. And it can be a large part of it. Substantial part of the, the divergence can be balanced. F is constant. Yeah, so I'm on a shallow water, I'll be using a double periodic shallow water code. I can't include beta. So I can't include vari variable F. If I went to a sphere, I have shallow water codes on a sphere. I could show results. I will be showing results if I get to them. <laughs> Maybe Friday, um, where we do do shallow water on a sphere and uh, then look at uh, various uh, dynamics. Although I don't recall if I have much on the balance and imbalance part, just because the way that I'm uh, forcing those flows is creating quite a bit of imbalance. So the, the in, decomposing balance and imbalance aren't so, isn't so interesting in that case. All right, so this is constant F in these. So the, the simplest thing you can do for the shallow water equations is constant F um, with no the flat bottom. So this is like the, the cleanest kind of um, system to be in. All right, so we, this is, Um, yeah, so I'm saying that you can, you can use other balance relations besides the ones I've written here. So you don't, you can think of it this way. So this is a, a choice. There are many choices. I didn't want to go through all the lists. I mean, the simple, the hierarchy would be taking any multiple number, you know, the nth time derivative of these. That would be one hierarchy. The one that um, Mohel Al-Hoji and I, myself did in 2001 was, to look at successive time derivatives of delta and set them to zero, do successive pairs. And so you can do that, you can play that game. Nothing tells you that they should be the right ways to do things, but it's just that it's a choice. And the problem is there's an infinite choice. And we now know that there isn't a, an optimal way of doing it this way. Um, there is this optimal PV balance, which I, uh, you'll hear about next week if you listen to Marcel Oliver, he'll describe what's going on there. And, if I'm pressed hard enough, I might actually present a slide on that, but uh, I won't do that yet. Um, but it, it attempts basically to get around this problem of the ambiguity of choosing a balance relation. So optimal PV balance allows you to forget all of this of trying to invent an F and a G that, that you use to impose this, but actually get the balance by doing kind of some pseudo integration of the equations themselves. 
it's expensive, right? All right, so then um, I'm not gonna spend much time on this. We've already gone through the fact that potential vorticity is linked to Kelvin circulation theorem. Um, and it's a, it has a special status because it's a conservative tracer, at least in the idealized cases we're considering here. Um, and with balance relations, as I've now described, you can then use this if you're willing to solve and put the effort in solving maybe nonlinear elliptic equations, you can then diagnose um, all the dynamical and thermodynamical fields by PV inversion. And the general statement of this for a 3D atmosphere is in Hoskins et al. But it's, in ge it's generally possible to do this in many systems. Um, and then just simply by subtraction from the original fields, the most interesting thing is to actually diagnose the gravity waves or the residual imbalance. So we're gonna do this, use the, um, this imbalance balanced approach to study imbalance both in um, the hydrostatic shallow water equations and the, the green Nagby equations, the agistrophic or non hydrostatic shallow water model. So we've already seen this shallow water model, just one slide, you know, it's a long wave theory. It goes back to Saint-Venant in 1871. Um, it makes both the fact, uh, two approximations, the velocity, horizontal velocity is independent of depth um, and the hydrostatic approximation. And then the more accurate model, which I um, showed yesterday was the green Nagy model, going back to Serre, and there's also Sue Gardner and other people, as many people contributed this over the last uh, 50 to 100 years now, or more than 100 years, um, where um, they derived a more accurate model, relaxing purely the hydrostatic approximation. So it's not essential you make the hydrostatic approximation. I keep emphasizing that point, though the model is more complicated. So computationally, it takes two or three times more effort than the shallow water approximation, shallow water model. Um, but uh, the benefit is that the green Nagy model allows you to more reliable, more reliably model shorter scales, scales that are comparable to the depth of the fluid. Okay, that's the only reason why it's been introduced. And we'll see that in some results. We saw some early results yesterday and we'll see a few more coming up. So we're going to basically look at the evolution of inertial gravity of rotating shallow water turbulence. So we didn't do that this time. Before we were looking at 3D flows with uh, some breakdown of a jet. Um, now we're going to stay within the 2D models um, and look at um, an initial conditions which generates turbulence, shallow water turbulence. Again, that's a problem that's been studied since um, McWilliams, Polvani, Spall, other people in their 80s, 70s. So shallow water turbulence has been beaten to death in terms of a subject, but that doesn't mean we know everything about it. In fact, we know still very little about it. It's just that people have done lots of simulations and say, I'm done, we're moving on to something else. And, but there's still a lot of rich information that's there to um, deduce. Um, okay, so I've already gone through all this, so we're gonna be uh, looking at this. Green Nagdi and VA are equivalent models. Green Nagdi is um, simply, it was, it was derived in an implicit way. So the, 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 as I described in yesterday's talk or one of the talks recently, I can't remember anymore, um, the Green Nagdi equations originally were derived in a way that um, um, has the pressure still left on the right-hand side of the momentum equation. The pressure itself involves a tiny rib of the divergence and in that form, um, numerically, it's difficult because it's an implicit equation. So you have time derivatives on right and left-hand sides of the equations. Moreover, the time derivative on the right-hand side of the equations multiplied by a lot of nonlinear things, and it's not easy. You can't pull it over and devise some nice numerical scheme that does that. Pierce Essler in 2010, uh, which is the closest um, work to this, where they included rotation for the first time in a two-dimensional context, um, they went part of the way by recognizing that they need to move some of the simplicitness to the left-hand side, so the linear part of it, but they still had implicit terms in their equation, which required a duration. So we were the first, as far as we're aware, that um, actually found that you can actually deduce the pressure directly by an elliptic equation. You do that, the equation is explicit, and that's what we call the vertically average group model, simply to distinguish the fact that it's an explicit green Nagy model rather than an implicit one. Okay, all right, so the green Nagy model, just to remind you, it has a potential vorticity conservation law. We deduced yesterday that this is 
obtained from the three-dimensional Rosby air cell potential vorticity or Beltrami Rosby air cell potential vorticity um, integrated over the depth. Um, so it's a vertically averaged uh, 3D air cell potential vorticity. It has this form. You have this new Jacobian term on the height field and the divergence. Uh, it also has all the other global invariants, but of course, in double periodic geometry, you don't have any momentum conservation because this domain's not circularly symmetric and other things, but you still have an energy. Um, so I haven't talked much about computation now, just a brief uh, word about computation. There'll be more potentially on Friday, but I'm not sure I'll ever get to that fourth talk. My, my four talks might be three or two and a half. <laughs> That's really not going. Uh, it's clearly way too ambitious. Anyway, um, so we use contour vection, which I've mentioned a little bit about before. Um, to model the uh, PV conservation. This is a relatively older, old algorithm now, uh, back in 2010. Um, it's based on moving material contours. So we're using contours of potential vorticity to represent the advection of potential vorticity, trying to get that as accurately as possible. Um, and alongside this, so I'm not going to go into details, except if you want, I can maybe show some stuff on Friday that goes into more detail about this. But Besides the contour vection, which is used only for the potential vorticity, so instead of solving dq dt equals zero, like on a grid or something, we actually moved points on contours with the underlying flow field that is obtained somewhere on the grid. So they're, it's sort of like a particle and cell method, but the points are connected along moving contours. The contours can deform, they can break, split topologically, they can be surgery, all this other stuff that I got in trouble for in my early career, but uh, it's a robust numerical method that uh, allows you to get um, high accuracy. And I would demonstrate that on Friday if I get to, get to that, but uh, we'll see. But so that we do this so that the potential vorticity can be computed without any kind of numerical dissipation, apart from that, that coming from the fact that I need to do surgery. I need to topologically reconnect contours. So there's a weak dissipation. Again, this is sort of for Friday's talk, if I get there, um, it's a relatively minor dissip dissipation compared to existing methods. It effectively buys you a factor of 10 to 20 times the resolution of standard methods. Now, that, that seems like a crazy claim. Um, so we've written some papers about this, the re most recent on the magnetic problem. Um, of, you can do these things in magnetic flows in 2D. Um, and we showed there that uh, um, by comparison with a standard pseudospectral method, we can do the, get the same results using contour advection um, with a grid 16 times finer in each direction, or you know, short, coarser in each direction. So the grid, we might use a grid of, say, 1,000 by 1,000. And a pseudospectral code would need 16,000 by 16,000 to get equivalent results. And you can then work out, well, we worked out for you the, uh, the cost, but the cost difference is on the order of a million. I mean, it's, just, it's vastly inefficient to use a sort of spectral code in this context. So we're using basically um, a state of the art in terms of the shallow water equations. We maybe arguably is the state of the art in terms of getting the most accurate um, simulation of shallow water flows in this idealized geometry. I'm not saying we can do everything. Um, alongside potential vorticity, we also have to think about um, the other variables and we use delta and gamma as our other pair of variables. So when you choose potential vorticity, remember that the original variables had H, U, and or the original system had H, U, and V as my set of variables. But now I'd like to use potential vorticity because I recognize it's conserved. And I can use contradiction, that's good. Um, but then of the H, U, and V that are left over, what do you choose? It's not sensible to use U and V, although they're sort of a symmetric pair because they're very closely related to potential vorticity already. Um, and uh, so it's better to actually use combinations of the remaining variables. And these are two combinations that are particularly relevant for the balance conditions that I'm using. Okay, so I have time dependent equations. So the delta T there, so if I take the time, if I write this as an equation for delta T, the delta T is exactly this. The delta T is this, the left hand side there. And the gamma T, would be that right hand side, okay? So if, if they're set to zero, then you, of course, then you have the balance condition, but we're not requiring that, okay? Then, okay, so we 
now have the general problem of inversion rather than PV inversion. Okay, so we have to then figure out, okay, now we, by using Q delta gamma, we're now faced by doing some elliptic inversion problems, which is weird because the original equations are hyperbolic in terms of the, the original statement. We're putting inversion, as I think, think I discussed offline yesterday, the inversion helps to um, um, capture some of the underlying balance, which is effectively elliptic, whereas the wave motion is hyperbolic. So the, these shallow water systems, while at face value are purely hyperbolic, actually contain an underlying balance, which is entirely elliptic. So he, you have this, you have this um, fight going on between the underlying balance dynamics, which is fundamentally elliptic, and the wave propagation, which is hyperbolic. And the wave propagation turns out to be a negligible, energetically, energy, it's negligible, negligible energetically compared to the balance motion. So if you invest all your efforts on shock capturing schemes or um, you can use method of characteristics, et cetera, there's lots of schemes out there, um, you basically do a very poor job on the balance part. Um, this is now understood. And um, this is something that uh, people like uh, um, John Thuburn at the Red Office and at University of Exeter has been thinking about in terms of you know, trying to keep the balance part in numerical models and the weather. Well, it's not true. It's not true generally that uh, the imbalance is always of the same order as the balance. In fact, uh, there are plenty of examples where the imbalance is much weaker than the balance. In cases where you don't prepare, people like to use data or initial data in mathematics. If you don't prepare the initial data and you let the imbalance be comparable to the balance, then what you're going to get maybe it doesn't really help to do a balance imbalance decomposition because everything is active. Yet, there's some element that it's kind of like, a, I think I was mentioning this to you yesterday, that you, you, anyone doing like a, having a coffee cup where they put cream in it and they swirl it around, you know, a little experiment that I remember in Cambridge, we were doing this with Michael McIntyre and sitting downstairs and, you know, at the pub or whatever, looking at things moving around in the coffee cup, you can oscillate the surface, you see the vortex moving around and you, the, the compressor is still spinning around. Okay, so the the wave motions, I mean, this is a very heuristic, uh, simple example, but the waves are not really interacting much with the, the vertical motions in that example. So even in cases where imbalance is comparable, comparable to balance, it doesn't mean the imbalance is actually influencing the balance dynamics much. And it still may be useful to pull out the, the balance part. And it's especially useful to um, potentially develop balance models like the QG approximation, where you filter entirely fast dynamics, and you can compute on a slow time scale. That's advantageous numerically to do that. So balance models have the advantage that you can compute things on the slow evolution time scale potential vorticity, ignoring all the fast time scales. Okay? So there's, that's why you do it. Okay? All right, so the standard thing to do for doing the inversion is you start by doing a so-called Helmholtz decomposition. Um, where you divide, you use a stream function and a scalar potential for the divergence, so called the divergence potential. Directly taking the horizontal divergence of these two equations, you get an equation, a Poisson equation, that tells you how to get the horizontal divergence potential from divergence. Um, so this is a standard spectral problem in WPR geometry, which is trivial. It's an algebraic multiplication. Um, so this is trivial. Um, other variable that's useful that I'll be using it frequently is the so-called dimensionless height anomaly. It's like our um, displacement variable that we used originally in the first day, um, eta tilde. So I'm calling it H tilde now. So it's a displacement uh, of the dimensionless displacement of the free surface, H minus capital H. And capital H is a constant due to mass conservation. It's a physical parameter that we need to have in the model. Okay. And then, well, it just... Keep it simple for the shallow water case, potential vorticity. Um, we, it's useful to, uh, or even prudent to use the so-called potential vorticity anomaly. So I'm just taking away the constant value of F. It doesn't change the conservation of it. Also, you may notice that um, below I've taken out the, the capital H that would be multiplied. So this would normally be just H in the denominator. 
Um, and I've replaced it by just one plus H tilde, so I've ignored the capital H here, which is a constant factor. It still follows that Q tilde is materially conserved for constant F. So this rescaling doesn't do anything except it at least means that the dimensions of Q tilde are frequency, um, like vorticity. It's potential vorticity and vorticity of the same units. And then in terms of this variable um, and the definition of um, gamma, um, so, so from the definition of potential vorticity alone, actually, uh, so you can actually work out, so you can calculate what zeta is here. Solving for zeta, you get, um, just by rearrangement, you get this combination of things, which then simplifies to this. So you have a Poisson equation that gives me psi if I know Q tilde, which I do, I'm assuming I've given that, and H tilde, which unfortunately I don't know. Okay, so then I have to do more work. So we don't know H tilde, but the definition of gamma is an equation like this, which has the Laplacian on H tilde. <laughs> Using what I just found out for zeta here, I can plug this together and rearrange this, and I get an, a Poisson equation, or actually a Helmholtz equation, um, with variable coefficients because of Q tilde here. That's the only variable coefficient. Um, Right-hand side is completely known. So this is an elliptic equation. Right, so and then it turns out that f plus q tilde has to be positive um, by definition, or else uh, you can get um, what would be it would be um, inertial instability or something in this method. So I think f plus q tilde always has to be positive right here, so that um, you can invert this problem. That's usually not a constraint. That means the Rossby number is not crazy. All right, so you get an equation. You therefore have h tilde here. Once once you have h tilde here, you then have you can compute the vorticity zeta from that line, you get psi, once you have psi, you get the velocity field, you're done. Okay, so just in summary, you find H tilde given Q tilde and gamma, then you find the relative vorticity from Q tilde and H, then you find psi by inverting one Poisson equation, find chi by inverting the other, you get U and V by differentiating, you're done. So you can then, in this way, obtain the original primitive equations or variables H, U, and V from the recast variables Q tilde, delta, and gamma when I'm using the model. So there's effort, there's extra effort there, but it builds in. I'm doing it because I'm quantum dynamics, but also because I'm trying to respect the underlying balance. If we don't do this, if for instance, if I said, okay, naively, I know I may be aware of this potential vorticity conservation, but I, I'm stubborn, I want to use HUV. Okay, because HUV is simple, the code's out there. Catalyst does it, whatever. I don't know if it does. Anyway, but there are there's thousands of codes out there, probably more than thousands, that would use HUV as standard variable. Interestingly, um, there was a point in time about 20, 30 years ago where people started using divergence and vorticity and height. Um, so Polvani and other people were starting to do this. Um, and without them knowing it, as far as we could tell, um, they obtained higher accuracy using this than they got from HUV, which are called the primitive variables. And essentially using differentiated forms of the variables, which are combinations of original variables, gave you higher accuracy. And it wasn't understood what was going on there, it's actually related to the underlying balance. So by using these variables, we're actually trying to more accurately represent the underlying balance of the flow. And we find, not insisting on it, because we're actually evolving them. Yeah, so the time derivatives are non-zero, and you'll see there is imbalance. But if you choose um, crazy variables, like well, I call it crazy variables, HUV, you find that there is lots of spurious gravity waves. That there's so many spurious gravity waves, you cannot tell the real ones from the, the fake ones. In fact, they're dominantly spurious from numerics. Okay, so discretization errors. This way, you avoid the discretization errors or minimize discretization errors. Okay. So just to be uh, fair, so we, we're going to evolve the same variables, potential vorticity, delta, gamma, in both the hydrostatic shallow water model and the green Nagy model. Um, we use a standard pseudospectral treatment with the so-called two-thirds rule to the alias. And for um, these delta and gamma variables, since they're evolved on a grid, we use a weak um, triharmonic hyperdiffusion, which is a fairly standard approach. I'm not, a, I'm not an advocate of hyperdiffusion, but sometimes you have to do the necessary evil do this. If you don't do this, then you get a growth of grid scale noise that builds up and will destroy your calculations. You have to do it. Um, and it's not so much to do. Hmm? Yeah. 
Yes. Exactly. I haven't told you that. That's what's part of contradiction. The contradiction. Yes. So the contradiction um, is done su such that the contours are interpolated to a grid, and they're interpolated onto a grid which is four times finer than the grid that I calculate the velocity on. Then they're averaged back to the so-called inversion grid where I calculate the velocity field. In doing this, I minimize interpolation errors coming from the discrete representation or short gradient. Okay. It's well, but that's another word that's out there, but it's not quite the same. It's like a smoothing kernel. Well, it's only smooth to the grid scale, but there's no point. We have no information below the grid scale in terms of velocity field. So we can only get the velocity field on the grid. So the contours, so unlike contradynamics, so contradynamics is a system where you use the contours themselves to work out the velocity field on the contours due to themselves. And that velocity field is not dependent on any kind of grid. Um, the velocity field can be arbitrary small scale. Here in this method, the velocity field has a small scale cutoff. And so high wave number perturbations, the velocity field are simply filtered away, okay? And uh, that's, the, that's the essence of SPH, that's the essence of particle and cell, all these things, we have to do it here. So contra, that's why it's not called contra dynamics. Contra advection means you advect from some source of velocity field, um, but you use contours. All right, and then other details are important, some kind of standard semi-implicit scheme with some, uh, uh, for the time stepping. Um, we use a basic grid resolution, which looks ridiculously small, 512 squared, but the effective resolution is around um, 8,000 squared. Um, the domain dimensions don't really matter. We're just going to take a square of standard 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 pi. Again, the coroless frequency doesn't matter. We're using it to be so that one unit of time is one day, in, in a sense. Um, the raw speed information length is a length that we need to set. It's specified in different experiments. Uh, we typically specify through the inverse deformation length or the Rosby deformation wave number, LKD, um, and then C root GH and H is the mean depth. So these things are, um, for the green Nagy model, we have to specify independently um, C and H, but in the uh, um, shallow water model, it turns out that all we need is C and uh, um, effectively LD. So at the only two parameters or two parameters we need to specify. So here's an example, then the initial condition. So we're gonna take um, a state of potential vorticity shown here on the left-hand side, um, not particularly turbulent looking, this is just the initial state. So we're just putting up a random field. The random field is derived from some kind of uh, spectrum, which has a K to five um, uh, dependence at small wave numbers and then falls off like a Gaussian high wave numbers and it generates this field. Um, this potential vorticity field then through the balance relations here and here, um, determine delta and gamma. So these are the initial states of delta and gamma. These are balanced by my definition. Okay. Now, they're not very large. Um, the divergence is about 0 0.06. By, by comparison, I didn't show the vorticity field here. Vorticity field is comparable to the potential vorticity field around six. So it's about uh, 100 times bigger than the divergence. And the acceleration divergence, well, sometimes they call it acceleration divergence, or the age of strong vorticity is around eight. But remember this has units of frequency squared, has an extra Coriolis frequency F multiplying it, which is four pi, so that's why the values look pretty big here. Um, and, a, and remember in QG theory, both this and this would be zero. Okay, so we're starting with non-zero values of this, but these are um, initially balanced. Okay, and then in the case of the um, vertically average model. So here we're actually uh, considering a finite uh, depth in point 0.4. If you were considering the shallow water approximation, shallow water approximation will correspond to H going to zero. So in the simulation results I'll show below, if I say H equals zero, H to zero, it means shallow water, okay? So H, H going to zero and gravity going to infinity, but keeping GH constant corresponds to the shallow water limit. So this is actually a vertically average or a green Nagy simulation, um, just the initial start of it. And I the balance relations have to be, you have to add one more relation, which is that the non-hydrostatic pressure is also zero initially to close the system. 
So we solve all those together and you get these fields. Now, the top row is showing the potential vorticity anomaly that's subtracting the Coriolis frequency. For the shallow water case, H equals zero, this is the full domain. This is well into, this is 50 days into the simulation from those smooth initial conditions we saw. Um, and then 150 days, and the final time is 500 days. The vortices get a little bit bigger in time. Um, the blue ones are anticyclones. So people who know about cyclone, anticyclone asymmetry that was studied by Neslin, by um, even Polvani, Spall, Williams, other people earlier in the, again, 70s and 80s, um, notice that the, all the anticyclones look like circular bullets. They're nice, beautiful, round objects. And if you look at the red regions, these are cyclones, they're all twisted. So people know about this, this is a typical evolution. There's an asymmetry between cyclone and anticyclone evolution. That could itself occupy some time describing all the differences, but fundamentally people ascribe that to the fact that the uh, deformation length, um, the effective local deformation length in an anticyclone is larger, and therefore it's maybe more 2D-like than in the, than the um, cyclone. Did I say anticyclone? Anticyclone, the deformation radius is larger. It behaves more 2D-like, more circular co core. And these ones are deformation scales much smaller. And we know from small deformation simulations of the quasitopic equations that this leads to elongated uh, structures with large-scale waves on them, kind of like oceanic situation. So this is, this is why the red regions look very different from the blue regions in this picture, okay? Now, down below is the same simulation starting from the exact same state um, using the green magby or vertically average model. And you can see it at, after 50 days, you have to str you struggle to try to figure out if there's a difference. I mean, there's a slight, I don't know, you really have to try to look hard, to see if there's any difference. That's your this is surprising. I mean, this is, H is equal 0.4 is about the limit you can go. You can go even to about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 before the equations start having trouble computation to get this, because the free surfaces deformations are so huge at this point. So you get this situation where even at this time, potential vorticity dynamics are almost identical. And oh yeah, they differ now at this time, not hugely, but you might even attribute that to loss of predictability. This is 500 days of evolution. So it could be loss of predictability that leads this difference or you know, there, are there are different equations being solved. So this is showing that there's not much difference in terms of the potential vorticity evolution. Now let's look at the divergence. There's a difference here. We're comparing, again, shallow water on top, evolving for 50, 150, 200, 500 days. This is the full divergence field, not balance or imbalance, the full divergence. Um, a lot of people, again, in the past would have said this is all gravity waves, okay? And it looks like it, maybe if, you're, if you don't have good eyes, you might say, well, this is all, looks like gravity waves to me. Um, of course, you can't look at an individual picture and, and convince yourself that's gravity waves. You actually have to look at see, see whether you see motion, you have to look at the frequency spectra, et cetera, to work out what's going on. The same calculation now with H equals 0.1. Now it's a fairly small depth, but it's green Nagby. It's using the vertically average model. It's a very shallow depth um, still, but the equations differ. And now if you look, um, well, at this time, there's not huge differences. Um, they start developing, and at late times, there's massive differences. The, the shallow water system has many small-scale structures that are um, there. Um, the amplitudes are about half of what they are here. Um, here you have larger-scale structures developing that are dominating at late times. So the, the divergence is, is developing and, and there is, is evolving in a different way, even for a value of H, which is quite small. And this would be a regime where um, this would be relevant, at least in some geophysical context. This is a, a typical value. 0.4 is probably too large unless you're at extreme scales. This is now, all right, so all, all I've done here is I've changed, that was the original divergence. Look, click carefully. Now I'm gonna show the balance, okay? But this is what I said. Most of what you're seeing there is, is the balance divergence. This is the original divergence. That's the balance part. Original balance, that's the imbalance. That's the difference between the two. And so in the shallow water context, you look at the, the scales, they're now much smaller, about a tenth. So if we look at the amplitudes, here they were up to 0 0.04, 0 0.02, 0 
0.008. If I go here, they're a tenth, maybe not a tenth anymore, but uh, these are still smaller values. The imbalance is still small compared to balance here. Um, and now you see that in the case of the shallow water case, um, the imbalance is like a random field. It doesn't have any spatial organization. It's like waves being refracted off the vortices moving in random directions when you get this structure. But look what happens in the green Nagy equations at h equals 0.1. Now the imbalance is, to begin with, already at larger scales and smoother. So two things have happened. It's a smoother field and it's at much larger scales. And h is only 0.1 here. There's a big difference in the evolution of um, the imbalance in this case. So the gravity waves, that these are inertial gravity waves, I'm arguing, and the gra inertial gravity waves are behaving fundamentally different, even for a small value of the depth. Um, and this shows how things change when, so the case we were just looking at was, was this one with h equals 0.1. I'm looking at the final time, time 500, where this is the shallow water case we just saw before. This is uh, um, the, um, the balance part of the divergence. This is the imbalance part um, at the final time for shallow water. In the previous show frames, I showed 0.1 for H. This is the difference between, again, the balance part, the imbalance part. If I go to 0.2, um, the structure of the imbalance changes dramatically. As you go from here to here, suddenly there's some kind of C change that means that the um, imbalance now is localized into a few structures like they're being trapped. So no longer the waves propagating away, they seem to be trapped now near vortices. Um, and that we understand now from the dispersion relationship, which we're gonna to come to in a minute. Um, so let's think about the linear waves. So how do we do that? So we go back to some mass now again, in primitive variables and looking at the non-hydrostatic uh, shallow water system, this we have this set of equations. Uh, and I've left off, oh yeah, no, I have correctly done this. So I've, I've reintroduced a, a kind of pressure. I'm not, I'm not trying to, or this is not the full 3D pressure. This is the pressure in the 2D model. The pressure consists of a hydrostatic part, GH squared over two, plus the non-hydrostatic part, PN. And I can rewrite the equations in this nice way. Um, and then the mass continuity equation as usual. Um, as we saw before, PN is determined by this linear elliptic equation with non-constant coefficients with H here. And gamma tilde has the usual messy form involving something like the gamma variable that we had before with some extra terms involving U and V and delta. Um, and here as before, delta and gamma are defined in terms of velocity in that usual way. So if we now linearize the equations, take those equations, you linearize them about a state of rest and about a mean depth H, then linear waves then um, satisfy this equation. Um, now I have PN prime explicitly here, um, H prime here. So all the prime variables correspond to displacements or small, per, they're infinitesimal perturbations, the equations. And the uh, height equation becomes this. This is just standard analysis. What's non-standard is including this term here, which makes it hard. If you, you, know, if you do this in, with the shallow water equations in a few lines, you're done and you got the dispersion relationship. But here you have this, the P equation, you get this equation now for the PN prime. Uh, now it's constant coefficient, Helmholtz equation, left-hand side, and you have some terms on the right-hand side. Well, you can put all these equations together. I'm not gonna do the algebra for you. Look for plane wave solutions, because nothing depends on X, Y, and T here. So you can look for solutions of this form. Do some algebra, more than a bit, perhaps. Um, and out pops the dispersion relationship, which has been known for many decades now. Um, and that the new term that comes up is this H squared K squared over three. HK is a dimensionless wave number. Remember, K is the horizontal wave number, H is the depth of the fluid. That's a key parameter that appears in, you know, long wave theories or wave theories in Boussinesque or whatever in 3D flows. Um, so the only thing that's changed, this is the, all the black terms are the usual ones from shallow water theory, S squared plus C squared, K squared. But now you have this additional term here and immediately you see there's an issue. When K goes to infinity, in the shallow water case, omega goes to infinity. But here, when K goes to infinity, omega goes to C divided by H and multiplied by root three. That's why it's going to a constant now. So it changes the dispersion relationship for high wave numbers in particular, for wave numbers greater than um, roughly one over H. What does it look like? So just re recall the hydrostatic one is 
of this form. Um, it's recovered when H goes to zero with G going to infinity. Um, but for H positive or non-zero, all frequencies lie between a Coriolis frequency and what I call the buoyancy frequency. So the buoyancy frequency, I like to define as root three C over H because then um, the frequencies lie between F and N. Kind of like the 3D Boussinesque equations where you do linearization there. So that's the analogy here. And so you can then um, show that the phase velocity decreases monotonically with wave number. You can compute the group velocity, which looks ugly here, and I'm not expecting you to remember the formula, but there is something odd going on here, because on the top here, um, this combination of physical constants can be zero. So for a particular, for a particular choice of H, given F and C, which is effectively raised the deformation length, you can get zero, which means that for all wave numbers k, you can make the group velocity vanish. Remember the wave trapping I mentioned before. This is what's illustrated here. So I just forget all the algebra here. If I look at the group velocity, so the group velocity is a black curve here as a function of what I call f over n. n is this uh, um, frequency I introduced before here, which is the square root 3g over h. Um, then as a function, uh, so the maximum group velocity over um, the uh, phase speed c um, decreases from 1 when your f over n equals 0. This is the, the usual, sh the shallow water limits down here. And then it basically decreases from 1 to 0. So when f over n is exactly 1, when the frequencies match, you have no propagation. And then it propagates again further up. So it's an unusual dispersion relationship. And this explains why um, you get wave trapping. So we say wave trapping occurs when f over n is uh, roughly 1. So in the case which I've been looking at, kd equals 6, f over n equals 1 corresponds to a free surface depth of 0.288, which is between these two values of h here. Here I'm showing a different field, like it's kind of related to divergence, but it's the imbalance pressure. And you can see that something dramatically different happens for values close to the wave trapping regime. Um, the structures, the gravity waves are, are located around mainly anticyclones in this case. Um, and the same thing for higher wave deformation lengths, lower deformation wave numbers. Now, um, between these two values, you get wave trapping, and then something weird starting to happen for um, very large depths in this case, where F over N is now much bigger than one. Strongly stratified would correspond to F over N small. And that would, so the strongly stratified case corresponds to H equals zero. This is the traditional shallow water limit. Weakly stratified corresponds to this regime here, where um, F over N is large, but N is small compared to F. It's not physical unless you have weak stratification. So there are cases where you can have a weakly stratified uh, regime. Like for instance, if you... Uh, In the, the, the group velocity and the dispersion ratio, yeah, so the, in, the, in the dispersion relationship for the 3D Euler equations, it does not. You're right. It doesn't. So, but there is, there is a variation of the group velocity for these particular waves. That's actually, a, that, I'll try to remember that point because that's a, that's a worthwhile exercise to work out the group velocity for the specialized surface waves um, that correspond to these waves, the vertically integrated waves or whatever and see what um, the group velocity looks like in the 3D equation. But I think there's going to be a dip there as well for F over N around one, and then it'll rise again. I don't know. I can't, I have, I can't do the calculation. But I imagine that Green Nagdi is more likely to be capturing some of the, some of the results that you see in 3D order. Has to be seen. Yeah, but that's a good point. I think... Uh, Considering it's already an hour, maybe I should stop here and then we'll continue uh, in the next uh, half hour with the remaining stuff. And then I might start um, talk three, which is what I should have started today anyway. But we'll see. Okay, so to continue with some of the results of the simulation. So it's the same simulations, just looking at um, different uh, um, results for different uh, depths. So, wait, so again, this is the... Um, 
Green-Nag the equations for 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 depth. Shallow water always corresponds to H equals zero. And just focus on the left-hand panel here, forget the right-hand side for the moment. But at our, with our standard setting of the inverse deformation length as at six here, then the upper curve shows the amplitude of the imbalance divergence as a function of time, up to 500 units of time, 500 days. This is the shallow water result. So the shallow water result starts at an amplitude of divergence around 10 to the minus three, and slowly decays, it's more or less keeping its amplitude over the entire um, length of time. This is log scaling, by the way. Um, if you increase the depth to 0 0.1, so now you're using the green 90 model, but now for fairly small equivalent depth, um, then the divergence initially um, plummets to a value that's roughly three to four times smaller than the shallow water level. So the RMS divergence is actually lower when you increase the depth by only a small amount. If you take the depth even larger, then you get even smaller. So the divergence basically, the imbalance divergence decreases to very small by, by more than a factor of 10 smaller than the shallow water case. And similar things are echoed at um, a smaller deformation length or larger deformation weight number. Again, shallow water has the greatest imbalance at middle to late times, um, and all the other ones are decaying faster. Um, um, to not zero necessarily, but going, apparently um, the green Nagdi model is balancing itself, which is an interesting result. Shallow water doesn't do that very well, but green Nagdi seems to be balancing itself, okay? You can maybe judge the a level of, uh, sorry, of, of numerical dissipation here. You would you, you think that the dissipation method would be decaying this field, um, but it doesn't decay much over this time. So this decay here is not numerics, it's probably physical decay of the thing. And it, what's decaying here might be numerical at this point, but it's a very small amount. Um, if you look at the same um, RMS imbalance, but now look at the imbalance pressure. Um, so this is a non-hydrostatic imbalance pressure. It's a very weak field. Again, shallow water has the most imbalance and the other models have less imbalance. Um, they're indicated here. Um, with the exception, when KD equals 12, um, the case where you have a large equivalent depth, or H equals 0.4, there's actually more imbalance um, when the F over N value is large, effectively, when H is 0.4. Um, so we're getting to a regime where you're very weakly stratified, um, and the weakly stratified case initially starts with more imbalance, but it turns out this imbalance here is that much larger scales than you find in the shallow water. It's a very different character. Um, yes, yeah, also here too. Yeah, so initially there's some peaks and then gradually decays. Yes. Yeah. I can't say I understand all of what's going on here, but um, you can also look at spectra. So this is now spectra at a fixed time, the latest time in the simulation, just keeping KD equals six for simplicity here. So the, bit, the original experiment Two different Rossby numbers, so we, you know the more QG-like regime and the maybe agistrophic regime here. So focusing on, let's say, the QG regime here, what we're finding is that if we are, so what we have, the different curves correspond to lots of different things here, but the um, the black curves here uh, correspond to the shallow water model, um, or the this one here, and uh, is it black? The dashed curve here, all, all the dashed curves correspond to shallow water. So you can see that there's a dashed spectrum. So this is wave number spectrum, um, amplitude of the divergence versus scale. So the spectral amplitudes, the power spectrum, if you like. Um, they peak at a certain wave number, which is comparable to the deformation length, and then they decay thereafter. So there's a, there's a steep spectrum. These are the, um, the balanced parts or the full spectrum. So when I, when I label things here, the B means balanced, and the um, I, do I have an I? Yes, I have an I there, imbalanced. The red means, Im so all the red curves correspond to imbalanced divergence, and all the blue and black correspond to either full or black. Yeah? Exactly, you do sine, cosine transforms, you know, full, full Fourier spectrum. It's a, because we're in W periodic geometry, it's a complex transform. So looking at the amplitudes of the complex mode squared gives you the power spectrum. And I think they're multiplied by a wave number as well, so that when you integrate the spectrum 
the power spectrum here, you get back the total diver divergence um, in the field, or the total squared amount by Parseval's theorem. Um, um, the approximate slope, I don't know if I've actually worked it out. It's pretty steep. So if you look at it, it's about minus eight here at roughly one, and then it goes down to, minus, it's like minus four. So maybe remarkably steep compared to what a lot of people report. What? More than that. It goes from one, a little more, well, one, maybe, maybe less than that, because it's dropping by minus, minus eight, a little bit more than minus 12, or between about 0.7 maybe and 2.2. Uh, maybe minus three. Close. Yeah, three, minus three, probably. Close. You're happy with four. You have a debate, <laughs> a vote. <laughs> um, and, well, the same spectral slope is found at higher Rossby numbers, maybe it's slightly shallower here for the balance. So, this, again, remember balance and imbalance, or the balance and the full fields are shown here. They're basically lying on top of each other. Um, the dashed corresponds to shallow water, and the full corresponds to green Nagy. Okay, and here we're taking... H equals 0 0.1, a fairly small value of the, the depth. Um, the imbalance, they say, is, is greatly reduced for wave numbers K greater than root 3 over H, which is basically this range here. So beyond this wave number here, in even at small Rossby numbers, we're seeing that the imbalance at large scales um, is basically unaffected by the green Nagy approximation or whatever, the, whether it's hydrostatic or not. Non-hydrostatic effects are being shown up here. There's more imbalance in the shallow water system than there is. Maybe it's not a big deal because it's, you're looking at um, 10 to minus 11 amplitudes, but there, it's definitely weaker um, at these intermediate scales and high wave numbers. And it's even more pronounced that higher Rossby numbers, you have a larger uh, region of, of, of wave numbers where you have reduced imbalance when you go to the green Nagy equations. Um, do I want to say anything more about this? So this is only the imbalance divergence. Yeah, okay. So this is now comparing different um, depths. So we only before we only looked at h equals 0 0.0 and 0 0.1 in the figure. Now we're focusing exclusively exclusively on the imbalance divergence, the spectrum of it. Um, and we're comparing lots of different curves here for different depths. From shallow water, which is the black curve here, which is the highest amplitude everywhere we found. Um, then the point 0.1 case we showed in the previous figure, there's this small Rossby number case. This is basically the same figure we had before. So those upper two curves correspond to um, the curves that are shown here, the red ones down here. And then I'm including a few more curves for point 0.2, the red curve here. Then this funny value 0.288, this corresponds to the special value of H gets F over N exactly equals one, where the group velocity vanishes across all wave numbers. And overall wave numbers, more or less, this has minimal imbalance. So the greatest reduction in imbalance corresponds with F over N is one. Yellow, it says, okay, I can barely read that myself, but the yellow curve here. And it's still true also for high Rossby numbers that typically, oh, it's probably less true here, but values that are, um, all the amplitudes here have low amplitudes of imbalance compared to the shallow water case. And here it's pretty, pretty dramatic. For Rossby number 0.6, we're looking at factors of 10 to the 3 difference between the imbalance you get in shallow water versus what you get in the non hydrostatic case. Um, AD12, I'm not going to go with that. It's basically the same kind of fit picture. Maybe it's a little bit more messy. But again, the, typically the least imbalance is found for the special case where f over n is equal to 1. And you get wave trapping. And that makes sense. The, Waves are trapped around the vortices. They're not able to propagate out. You can't keep spreading um, the signal out into the domain and building up the imbalance. Okay, so frequency spectra. Just to remind you what's happening here. So we derived this before that the frequency spectrum has this form here, but it can also be written in terms of F and N. Um, if you use a rescaled wave number, KH, um, it reminds you that N is defined as root 3 G over H. So this is... Not quite the same thing you see in the 3D equations, but close to it. Um, and this shows that frequencies are between F and N. Um, and when kappa goes to zero, if you look at this expression here, when kappa goes to zero, these terms are all zero. Omega goes to F, 
These are long waves, always have um, frequencies equal to the Coriolis frequency. And short waves, when kappa goes to infinity, um, then omega goes to n. So short waves are always the buoyancy waves, buoyancy oscillations. Okay? So then I'm going to finish with just a discussion of the frequency spectrum. So this is, you know, up to now, you might be wondering why I haven't talked about frequency spectrum, because it seems like that's the thing you use to distinguish gravity waves from everything else. So um, the most dramatic differences between shallow water and the green nagdi or vertically average model come from looking at frequency spectra. So the way it was done in the simulations is I took the divergence field. I, I couldn't save, save every grid point, so I just took 16 equally spaced grid points, randomly placed in the domain. Um, actually, it weren't random, but equally spaced. So just 16 grid points in the domain. And the, um, the divergence was saved as a time series on each of these uh, grid points. So it makes a long time series of probably many millions of points. And then each of these were um, processed to form a Fourier frequency spectrum. And then the average, the average spectrum was then combined by taking all 16 samples and putting them into one graph. Okay, that gives you the power spectrum with respect to frequency of a particular field, delta here. This is what's happening here. So again, k to equals six is the base case we started with, deformation length one over six. In this case, our frequency spectrum of divergence. There are, again, four results shown here. Um, the shallow water case is always in black. And you're seeing, so here's log scale of frequency versus log of the frequency um, down here. Um, and I've drawn various lines here I'll come to in a moment. Forget the vertical lines right now, but look at the black curve. So, well, if it's a curve, but it's a very ragged curve, it's typically what you get when you sample this many, when you have about a million samples, is you're going to get something like this. Uh, I haven't tried to average anything. The black curve shows the frequencies. Um, and what you're finding um, here are frequency. This is the shallow water spectrum. And this is generally regarded as the spectrum of gravity waves. So these are um, the frequency here corresponds to um, I think the Coriolis frequency should be I think where that is actually. I think it actually lies at zero. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So the Coriolis frequency should lie. Yeah, so I think zero should be here. And so all the gravity wave frequencies should be sitting out here. And you see a bump in the spectrum. OK. Um, now, this is the full divergence. So it's including the balance part as well. Because it's it, to calculate the imbalanced frequency spectrum would require me to, at every instant of time, balance the flow and save the data. It would be a calculation that taken years to do. I couldn't do it. So I had to cheat, well, not cheat, but the, the poor man's way of doing it is basically calculate the, the full spectrum or the full divergence. So what you're seeing is the balance part. So this is, there's a frequency spectrum associated with the balance part, which is um, growing towards low frequencies. Essentially, it's saying that there's a lot of low frequency balance um, going on. Low frequency divergence evolution, this is the balance part of the divergence. And the gravity waves are sitting out here dominating high frequencies. Okay. If you now go to the blue curve, the blue curve corresponds to a relatively small depth in the green nagdi equations. Um, the blue spectrum lies below the black one and essentially vanishes over this region. Or it, or it tails down to a curve which is similar to the one above it. So high frequencies are completely cut off. And now this blue line here corresponds to the buoyancy frequency N that I defined. So now the, bl the blue line corresponds to the buoyancy frequency, the N. This is my argument that the, these frequencies should lie between N and F. And so the bump you're seeing here are the gravity waves. So it's convincing. These are gravity waves associated with the green Nagy equation. And if you then do the same thing for point two, the red curve, now they lie between this red line and F, which is sitting here. Um, and then finally, the um, yellow curve is here. OK? Um, and actually, I think the green line here, because um, the close frequency is 4 pi, um, I think the, um, the green line corresponds to, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is it green? This is the Coriolis frequency. 
the chorus frequency is actually sitting here. Now you can see the blue starts right up, the black and the blue erupt right at the chordal frequency, and the shallow water only decays towards the, so the time step that I'm using. So there's a very clear correspondence. Um, it's just what I get. It, yeah, it could it could be to do with the mo the orbital frequency of things around the vortices moving around the individual coherent structures. I'm not sure. So th those frequencies could be generating. Hmm? No, no. These are this is a just purely sampled. Uh, yeah, I mean. It, I don't understand why there's a dip in power. I guess the real question is, why is there a dip in power in the shallow water case around this frequency? What's happening there? I don't really know. Okay, so there seems to be, maybe that frequency doesn't have any kind of uh, vortex interaction taking place that is particularly, yeah, it's, it's intermediate. Hmm? Uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Oh, the Rosby radius, yeah, size of domain, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I don't think we ever got to the bottom of why there's a dip, but the dip isn't seen in the blue curve so much. Maybe you could see, it. Oh, sorry. Well, what's relevant is the KD equals six. So this is, remember, KD equals six means you can fit six, six deformation um, wavelengths in the domain, okay? So KD and KD, K equals one is the lowest wave number I resolve. Um, that varies in the domain. So it's not far off that. So I don't know if that's really related to um, to this dip, whether this is six times, you know, it could be the factor KD is six, is six times smaller than the F. There may be something there. Good point, I'll have to think about that later. Maybe some debate we can have after, but, um, but there is a dip, there is a dip. No, but I, yeah. no, I don't know, I just, it, it could be worth thinking about whether there's somehow an interaction with KD. We're, I have results for KD equals 12 coming up, which um, we'll see if this dip moves by a factor two out, and it's related to that somehow. I don't know, I did try to explain that, but I can't do it on the fly. I'm not that good. All right, so then the, the blue region is this, this next one. Point two is the red one. Notice the amplitudes of the gravity waves are weaker. Um, and then for the yellow curve, they're almost non-existent. You hardly see gravity waves at all in this spectrum. It, it's hard to distinguish. And the same thing's true for higher Rosby numbers. It's messier because the flow is much more nonlinear. Um, again, you get this double um, bump with a dip in it. Um, it's not so evident. I guess there's also kind of a dip in the blue one, but it's sort of hard. It, you don't see it really rise again, maybe there a little bit. Um, and again, the colors mean the same thing. Um, that they said they were before, but it's just basically you wouldn't expect linear theory about a state of rest, a state of rest and a flat free surface to apply when the Rossman number is 0.6 and the free surface variations are 100 percent. Okay, so it's it's remarkable that they that there's any correspondence between linear theory and this. Yeah, there's much more power too. Yeah, look at the factor of 100 more. Yeah, exactly. Rossman number. Uh, so now KD is 12. So this is point, this, that was six, 12, the bump is gone. <laughs> so so the, now the, the, the shallow water dispersion relationship is here. The green line corresponds to F equals uh, co the chorus frequency here. The shallow water waves appear directly here and extend all the way to the time step, inverse time step. Um, Again, the uh, point one corresponds to the green negative equations for small depth point one, and it it lies it starts at four chorus frequency, extends and dips just after the buoyancy frequency and sitting here. Um, red is a point two case. Here, the buoyancy frequency is less than the coriolis frequency. It's weakly stratified, and now it's there's but there's still a bump of gravity waves sitting there. It's just the, they're like turned on its side. They're turned backwards on each other, which you don't usually see. Um, and again, now you see the yellow bump is also between uh, appearing. They, they don't really appear here, but there's a range of, of excited gravity waves. And the fact that they're this big explains why the imbalance there was bigger. 
Okay, we have more imbalance in that, that case, and they're occurring at lower frequencies. So you two things are happening. The, the frequencies are getting lower, um, and they're compressing into narrow ranges, but now extending out again when the gap between N and F are increasing again. And high Rosman number is just basically a much messier uh, picture. Um, again, the shallow water gravity waves are much larger at high frequencies. Um, it's less clear what's happening for the other cases. Some, some evidence, there's some gravity waves for the blue curve. It's, uh, it's hard to tell what's going on for the other three curves. That's KD equals six. Well, yeah, and for higher Rossby numbers, it seems to be trying to come back again. For lower Rossby numbers, it's gone. So maybe it's linked to a Rossby number effect. That's what it seems to be saying, because at low Rossby numbers, you don't see the uh, dip. And here at high Rossby numbers, you're starting to see an evidence of a dip going on. And here, um, arguably, the dip is more pronounced. I don't know. Maybe that's conjecture. All right. Conclusions. Just three more slides to go, and then I will release you from your agony. Um, so <laughs> I'll release myself. No. Uh, um, so the inclusion of non-hydrostatic effects generally complicates the equations of motion. Right? That's a bad thing. Um, yet, um, these effects reduce inertial gravity emission, which is good, and provide a natural frequency bound useful for limiting the time step. That's particularly helpful for numerical simulations. So you now know you have a bounded frequency range, you don't have a stiff problem anymore. So green magdi is not stiff. And it's the same reason why non-hydrostatic models in the atmosphere and the oceans have that advantage that the frequencies are bounded. You don't have a higher, you don't have to keep, well, you can, of course, get around it by saying, I'll use semi-implicit and use a big time step. But you're doing something, you're corrupting the gravity waves, something we've written lots about, I'm not going to discuss now, but numerically that's bad, but you can do it. And that's a way of filtering or modifying what's taking place there. Um, but you're not, you're not modeling gravity waves anymore. Um, so counterintuitively then, relaxing hydrostatic balance leads to more balance. That's bizarre. Like that, if there's anything to remember from this talk, it's that. What a strange statement to make. You get rid of one of the balanced things, right? You get rid of hydrostatic balance, and you get actually more balanced out of the system. The system behaves more balanced. Yeah. 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 I think I think it's really coming down to the fact the waves are much more dispersive in the Green Nagdi equation than they are in the original one. Um, remember the frequencies go like K at high wave numbers, and so the group velocity is just going to a constant there, um, whereas in the Green Knight equation, it's very dispersive. Um, and so that dispersion basically means that the waves can um, build up anywhere. It's probably related to what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. No, we haven't. The 3D Euler should be looked at um, in terms of its gravity waves. So that has the same, the same calculation done here to try to work out what imbalances in the gravity 3D Euler is tough, it's doable. Yes, actually you could. I mean, you could, what the thing is I would have to, I, I haven't done, well, that's a very good point, it'd be worth doing this is to, run exactly the same simulation in 3D order, uh, starting from a 2D state, columnar state, um, then do vertically averaged and calculate the spectrum and see what you get. I agree, that would be very interesting to do, the, do exactly the same analysis. It'd take 100 times more effort, but I would think it's worth, it's worth doing. So I think it's a very good point. That, that should be done. Okay, so continuing. Um, so the key parameter in the Green-Nagdi equation is this uh, point, Coriolis buoyancy frequency ratio, f over n, 
where n is defined this way in the, in the actually the VA model. Um, when f over n is much smaller than one, then you have this situation where non-hydrostatic effects are very weak, um, which is probably the typical, well, not top, probably, it's, it is commonly the typical situation you get in um, atmospheric ocean dynamics. Um, and non-hydrostatic effects are weak, except in very small scales where the length scale can be, becomes comparable to the depth of fluid. But if you actually think about an atmospheric model, you know, the, if you think of a depth being around 10 kilometers, you're getting only around to those scales now in global atmospheric models of weather. So you're, you're reaching that scale now. And we're, but for a long time already, 10, 20 years, um, global circulation models of the weather have been using non hydrostatic models. Okay, but that's probably for other reasons too, to do with the upper atmosphere. When f of n is, or so I already said this, inertial gravity waves tend to be small scale and widely dispersed. This is the picture you get for the shallow water case. However, when you take f of n comparable to one, of course, then with the caveat that Bill raises that um, this is not the full 3D Euler case, but in the green Nagy case, when f of n equals one, non hydrostatic effects strongly suppress inertial gravity waves and trap the waves near intense circling regions, predominantly the anticyclones. So you get this picture where every anticyclone has a group of quadrupolar or octopolar structures just rotating around them. You, if I had a movie, you just see them beautifully moving, the waters move around and all the waves just sort of move around with them. It's beautiful. Um, and then when F over N is much larger one, this weakly stratified flow, um, probably not, the model's not even relevant anymore, but you end up getting a situation where the waves again are no longer trapped, but they're now large scale filling the domain um, like this, they're very unusual looking waves. Finally then, um, as I mentioned already, Typically, F of N is much smaller than one in the atmosphere and the oceans. There may be exceptions, like weak stratification regions in the Western Mediterranean, maybe polar oceans, estuaries, if you're in Scotland, locks, uh, whatever, but uh, there are you know, weak rotation effects, uh, strat weak stratification, um, maybe other planetary atmospheres. As a general GFD problem, it's interesting to know um, what changes take place when you include um, the non hydrostatic effects. Um, so this is basically the point here is that it's useful to understand what effect um, relaxing the hydrostatic approximation has on fundamental processes. And in a paper which was Steve Tobias recently, or recently we were hoping to resubmit by Friday on, to GFM is uh, extending this whole thing to the magnetic case. It's not relevant to this conference, but you can do the same thing in magnetic flows. And there's some work with Ted Johnson who'll be here next week um, and colleagues that used to be in, with me in St. Andrews um, on the application to bottom topography. And that's also very interesting um, and it complicates things um, significantly, but there's some really nice uh, problems that one can study to do with flows over sea mounts, et cetera. With that, I will stop today. And uh, that's a good way, that's the end of um, my talk too at the day, end of day three. So thank you. Thank you.